A Debt of Honor, a Ghost Story by J. Sheridan Lefanu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. A Debt of Honor, a Ghost Story by J. Sheridan Lefanu. Hush! What was that cry, so low, but yet so piercing, so strange, but yet so sorrowful? It was not the marmot upon the side of the rigi. It was not the heron down by the lake. No, it was distinctively human. Hush! There it is again, from the churchyard, which I have just left. Not ten minutes have elapsed since I was sitting on the low wall of the churchyard of Vegas, watching the calm glories of the moonlight illuminating with silver splendor the lake of Lucerne but I am certain there was no one within the enclosure but myself. I am mistaken, surely. What a silence there is upon the night, not a breath of air now to break up into a thousand brilliant ripples the long reflection of the August moon, nor to stir the foliage of the chestnuts, not a voice in the village, no splash of oar upon the lake. All life seems at perfect rest, and the solemn stillness that reigns about the topmost glaciers of S. Gothard has spread its mantle over the warmer world below. I must not linger. As it is, I shall have to wake up the porter to let me into the hotel. I hurry on. Not ten paces, though, again I hear the cry. This time it sounds to me like the long, sad sob of a wearied and broken heart. Without staying to reason with myself, I quickly retrace my steps. I stumble about among the iron crosses and the graves, and displace, in my confusion, wreaths of immortelles and fresher flowers. A huge mausoleum stands between me and the wall upon which I had been sitting not a quarter of an hour ago. The mausoleum casts a deep shadow upon the side nearest to me. Ah, something is stirring there. I strain my eyes. The figure of a man passes slowly out of the shade and silently occupies my place upon the wall. It must have been his lips that gave out that miserable sound. What shall I do? Compassion and curiosity are strong. The man whose heart can be rent so sorely ought not to be allowed to linger here with his despair. He is gazing as I did upon the lake. I mark his profile, clear-cut and symmetrical. I catch the luster of large eyes. The face, as I can see it, seems very still and placid. I may be mistaken. He may merely be a wanderer like myself. Perhaps he heard the three strange cries and has also come to seek the cause. I feel impelled to speak to him. I pass from the path by the church to the east side of the mausoleum, and so come toward him, the moon full upon his features. Great heaven, how pale his face is! Good evening, sir. I thought myself alone here, and wondered that no other travellers had found their way to this lovely spot. Charming, is it not? For a moment he says nothing, but his eyes are full upon me. At last he replies, It is charming, as you say, Mr. Reginald Westcar. You know me? I exclaim in astonishment. Pardon me, I can scarcely claim a personal acquaintance but yours is the only English name entered today in the Livre des Trangers. You are staying at the Hotel de la Concorde, then? An inclination of the head is all the answer vouchsafed. May I ask, I continue, whether you heard just now a very strange cry repeated three times? A pause. The lustrous eyes seem to search me through and through. I can hardly bear their gaze. Then he replies, I fancy I heard the echoes of some such sounds as you describe. The echoes? Is this, then, the man who gave utterance to those cries of woe? Is it possible? The face seems so passionless, but the pallor of those features bears witness to some terrible agony within. I thought someone must be in distress, I rejoined hastily, and I hurried back to see if I could be of any service. Very good of you, he answers coldly. But surely such a place as this is not unaccustomed to the voice of sorrow. No doubt. My impulse was a mistaken one. But kindly meant. You will not sleep less soundly for acting on that impulse, Reginald Westcar. He rises as he speaks. He throws his cloak round him and stands motionless. I take the hint. My mysterious countryman wishes to be alone. 
Someone that he has loved and lost lies buried here. Good night, sir, I say, as I move in the direction of the little chapel at the gate. Neither of us will sleep the less soundly for thinking of the perfect repose that reigns around this place. What do you mean? he asks. The dead, I reply, as I stretch my hand toward the graves. Do you not remember the lines in King Lear? After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. But you have never died, Reginald Westcar. You know nothing of the sleep of death. For the third time, he speaks my name almost familiarly, and, I know not why, a shudder passes through me. I have no time in my turn to ask him what he means, for he strides silently away into the shadow of the church, and I, with a strange sense of oppression upon me, return to my hotel. The events which I have just related passed in vivid recollection through my mind as I traveled northward one cold November day in the year 1850 blank. About six months previously I had taken my degree at Oxford, and had since been enjoying a trip upon the continent, and on my return to London I found a letter awaiting me from my lawyers, informing me, somewhat to my astonishment, that I had succeeded to a small estate in Cumberland. I must tell you exactly how this came about. My mother was a Miss Ringwood, and she was the youngest of three children. The eldest was Aldina, the second was Geoffrey, and the third, my mother Alice. Their mother, who had been a widow since my mother's birth, lived at this little place in Cumberland, which was known as the Shallows. She died shortly after my mother's marriage with my father, Captain Westcar. My aunt Aldina and my uncle Geoffrey, the one at that time aged twenty-eight and the other twenty-six, continued to reside at the Shallows. My father and mother had to go to India, where I was born, and where, when quite a child, I was left an orphan. A few months after my mother's marriage, my aunt disappeared. A few weeks after that event, and my uncle Geoffrey dropped down dead as he was playing at cards with Mr. Marion, the proprietor of a neighboring mansion known as The Mere. A fortnight after my uncle's death, my Aunt Aldina returned to the shallows, and never left it again till she was carried out in her coffin to her grave in the churchyard. Ever since her return from her mysterious disappearance, she maintained an impenetrable reserve. As a schoolboy, I visited her twice or thrice, but these visits depressed my youthful spirits to such an extent that as I grew older I excused myself from accepting my aunt's not very pressing invitations and at the time I am now speaking of, I had not seen her for eight or ten years. I was rather surprised, therefore, when she bequeathed me the shallows, which, as the surviving child, she inherited under her mother's marriage settlement. But the shallows had always exercised a grim influence over me, and the knowledge that I was now going to it as my home oppressed me. The road seemed unusually dark, cold, and lonely. At last I passed the lodge, and two hundred yards more brought me to the porch. Very soon the door was opened by an elderly female, whom I well remembered as having been my aunt's housekeeper and cook. I had pleasant recollections of her, and was glad to see her. To tell the truth, I had not anticipated my visit to my newly acquired property with any great degree of enthusiasm, but a very tolerable dinner had an inspiriting effect, and I was pleased to learn that there was a bin of old Madeira in the cellar. Naturally, I soon grew cheerful, and consequently talkative, and summoned Mrs. Balk for a little gossip. The substance of what I gathered from her rather diffusive conversation was as follows. My aunt had resided at the Shallows ever since the death of my uncle Geoffrey, but she had maintained a silent and reserved habit, and Mrs. Balk was of opinion that she had had some great misfortune. She had persistently refused all intercourse with the people at the Mere. Squire Marion, himself a cold and taciturn man, had once or twice showed a disposition to be friendly, but she had sternly repulsed all such overtures. Mrs. Balk was of opinion that Miss Ringwood was not quite right, as she expressed it, on some topics, especially did she seem impressed with the idea that the mere ought to belong to her. It appeared that the Ringwoods and Marions were distant connections, that the mere belonged in former times to a certain Sir Henry Benet, that he was a bachelor, and that Squire Marion's father and old Mr. Ringwood were cousins of his, and that there was some doubt as to which was the real heir, that Sir Henry, who disliked old Marion, had frequently said he had set any chance of dispute at rest by bequeathing the mere property by will to Mr. Ringwood, my mother's father, 
that on his death no such will could be found. And the family lawyers agreed that Mr. Marion was the legal inheritor, and my uncle Geoffrey and his sisters must be content to take the shallows or nothing at all. Mr. Marion was comparatively rich, and the Ringwoods poor. Consequently, they were advised not to enter upon a costly lawsuit. My Aunt Aldina maintained to the last that Sir Henry had made a will, and that Mr. Marion knew it, but had destroyed or suppressed the document. I did not gather from Mrs. Balk's narrative that Miss Ringwood had any foundation for her belief, and I dismissed the notion at once as baseless. And my Uncle Geoffrey died of apoplexy, you say, Mrs. Balk. I don't say so, sir, no more than did Miss Ringwood, but they said so. Whom do you mean by they? The people at the mere, the young doctor, a friend of Squire Marion's who was brought over from York, and the rest. He fell heavily from his chair, and his head struck against the fender. Playing at cards with Mr. Marion, I think you said. Yes, sir, he was too fond of cards, I believe, was Mr. Geoffrey. Is Mr. Marion seen much in the county? Is he hospitable? Well, sir, he goes up to London a good deal, and has some friends down from town occasionally but he does not seem to care much about the people in the neighborhood. He has some children, Mrs. Balk? Only one daughter, sir. A sweet pretty thing she is. Her mother died when Miss Agnes was born. You have no idea, Mrs. Balk, what my Aunt Aldina's great misfortune was? Well, sir, I can't help thinking it must have been a love affair. She always hated men so much. Then why did she leave the shallows to me, Mrs. Balk? Ah, you are laughing, sir. No doubt she considered that the mere ought to belong to you, as the heir of the Ringwoods, and she placed you here, as near as might be, to the place. In hopes that I might marry Miss Marion, eh, Mrs. Balk? You're laughing again, sir. I don't imagine she thought so much of that, as of the possibility of your discovering something about the missing will. I bade the communicative Mrs. Balk good night, and retired to my bedroom, a low, wide, somber, oak-paneled chamber. I must confess that family stories had no great interest for me, living apart from them at school and college as I had done, and as I undressed I thought more of the probabilities of sport the 800 acres of wild shooting belonging to the shallows would afford me, than of the supposed will my poor aunt had evidently worried herself about so much. Thoroughly tired after my long journey, I soon fell fast asleep amid the deep shadows of the huge four-poster, I mentally resolved to chop up into firewood at an early date, and substitute for it a more modern iron bedstead. How long I had been asleep I do not know, but I suddenly started up, the echo of a long, sad cry ringing in my ears. I listened eagerly, sensitive to the slightest sound, painfully sensitive, as one is only in the deep silence of the night. I heard the old-fashioned clock I had noticed on the stairs strike three. The reverberation seemed to last a long time, then all was silent again. A dream, I muttered to myself as I lay down upon the pillow. Madeira is a heating wine, but what can I have been dreaming of? Sleep seemed to have gone altogether, and the busy mind wandered among the continental scenes I had lately visited. By and by, I found myself in memory once more within the Vegas churchyard. I was satisfied. I had traced my dream to the cries that I had heard there. I turned round to sleep again. Perhaps I fell into a doze. I cannot say, but again I started up at the repetition, as it seemed outside my window, of that cry of sadness and despair. I hastily drew aside the heavy curtains of my bed. At that moment the room seemed to be illuminated with a dim, unearthly light, and I saw, gradually growing into human shape, the figure of a woman. I recognized in it my aunt, Miss Ringwood, Horror-struck, I gazed at the apparition. It advanced a little. The lips moved. I heard it distinctly say, Reginald Westcar, the mere belongs to you. Compel John Marion to pay the debt of honor. I fell back senseless. When next I returned to consciousness, it was when I was called in the morning. The shutters were opened, and I saw the red light of the dawning winter sun. There is a strange sympathy between the night and the mind. All one's troubles represent themselves as increased a hundredfold if one wakes in the night and begins to think about them. A muscular pain becomes the certainty of an incurable internal disease, and a headache suggests incipient softening of the brain. But all these horrors are dissipated with the morning light, 
and the afterglow of a cold bath turns them into jokes. So it was with me on the morning after my arrival at the shallows. I accounted most satisfactorily for all that had occurred, or seemed to have occurred, during the night, and resolved that, though the old Madeira was uncommonly good, I must be careful in future not to drink more than a couple of glasses after dinner. I need scarcely say that I said nothing to Mrs. Balk of my bad dreams, and shortly after breakfast I took my gun and went out in search of such game as I might chance to meet with. At three o'clock I sent the keeper home, as his capacious pockets were pretty well filled, telling him that I thought I knew the country and should stroll back leisurely. The gray gloom of the November evening was spreading over the sky as I came upon a small plantation which I believed belonged to me. I struck straight across it, emerging from its shadows, I found myself by a small stream and some marshy land. On the other side, another small plantation. A snipe got up, I fired and tailored it. I marked the bird into this other plantation and followed. Up got a covey of partridges. Bang, bang, one down by the side of an oak. I was about to enter this covert when a lady and gentleman emerged, and struck with the unpleasant thought that I was possibly trespassing, I at once went forward to apologize. Before I could say a word, the gentleman addressed me. May I ask, sir, if I have given you permission to shoot over my preserves? I beg to express my great regret, sir, I replied as I lifted my hat in acknowledgment of the lady's presence, that I should have trespassed upon your land. I can only plead as my excuse that I fully believed I was still upon the manor belonging to the shallows. Gentlemen who go out shooting ought to know the limits of their estates, he answered harshly. The boundaries of the shallows are well defined, nor is the area they contain so very extensive. You have no right upon this side of the stream, sir. Oblige me by returning. I merely bowed, for I was nettled by his tone, and as I turned away I noticed that the young lady whispered to him. One moment, sir, he said. My daughter suggests the possibility of your being the new owner of the shallows. May I ask if this is so? It had not occurred to me before, but I understood in a moment to whom I had been speaking, and I replied, Yes, Mr. Marion, my name is Westcar. Such was my introduction to Mr. and Miss Marion. The proprietor of the mere appeared to be a gentleman, but his manners were cold and reserved, and a careful observer might have remarked a perpetual restlessness in the eyes, as if they were physically incapable of regarding the same object for more than a moment. He was about sixty years of age, apparently and though he now and again made an effort to carry himself upright, the head and shoulders soon drooped again, as if the weight of years, and, it might be, the memory of the past, were a heavy load to carry. Of Miss Marion, it is sufficient to say that she was nineteen or twenty, and it did not need a second glance to satisfy me that her beauty was of no ordinary kind. I must hurry over the records of the next few weeks. I became a frequent visitor at the Mere, Mr. Marion's manner never became cordial, but he did not seem displeased to see me. And as to Agnes, well, she certainly was not displeased either. I think it was on Christmas Day that I suddenly discovered that I was desperately in love. Miss Marion had been for two or three days confined to her room by a bad cold, and I found myself in a great state of anxiety to see her again. I'm sorry to say that my thoughts wandered a good deal when I was at church upon that festival and I could not help thinking what ample room there was for a bridal procession up the spacious aisle. Suddenly my eyes rested upon a mural tablet inscribed to the memory of Aldina Ringwood. Then, with a cold thrill, there came back upon me what I had almost forgotten, the dream, or whatever it was, that had occurred on the first night of the shallows, and those strange words, The mere belongs to you, compel John Marion to pay the debt of honor. Nothing but the remembrance of Agnes's sweet face availed for the time to banish the vision, the statement, and the bidding. Miss Marion was soon downstairs again. Did I flatter myself too much in thinking that she was as glad to see me as I was to see her? No, I felt sure that I did not. Then I began to reflect seriously upon my position. My fortune was small, quite enough for me, but not enough for two and as she was heiress of the mere and a comfortable rent roll of some six or eight thousand a year, was it not natural that Mr. Marion expected her to make what is called a good match? Still, I could not conceal from myself the fact that he evinced no objection whatever to my frequent visits at his house, nor to my taking walks with his daughter when he was unable to accompany us. 
One bright frosty day I had been down to the lake with Miss Marion, and had enjoyed the privilege of teaching her to skate, and on returning to the house we met Mr. Marion upon the terrace. He walked with us to the conservatory. We went in to examine the plants, and he remained outside, pacing up and down the terrace. Both Agnes and myself were strangely silent. Perhaps my tongue had found an eloquence upon the ice, which was well met by a shy thoughtfulness upon her part. But there was a lovely color upon her cheeks, and I experienced a very considerable and unusual fluttering about my heart. It happened as we were standing at the door of the conservatory, both of us silently looking away from the flowers upon the frosty view, that our eyes lighted at the same time upon Mr. Marion. He, too, was apparently regarding the prospect, when suddenly he paused and staggered back as if something unexpected met his gaze. "'Oh, poor Papa! I hope he is not going to have one of his fits!' exclaimed Agnes. "'Fits? Is he subject to such attacks?' I inquired. "'Not ordinary fits,' she answered hurriedly. "'I hardly know how to explain them. They come upon him occasionally, and generally at this period of the year.' "'Shall we go to him?' I suggested." No, you cannot help him, and he cannot bear that they should be noticed. We both watched him. His arms were stretched up above his head, and again he recoiled a step or two. I sought for an explanation in Agnes's face. A stranger, she exclaimed. Who can it be? I looked toward Mr. Marion. A tall figure of a man had come from the farther side of the house. He wore a large, loose coat and a kind of military cap upon his head. Doubtless you are surprised to see me, John we heard the newcomer say in a confident voice, but I am not the devil, man, that you should greet me with such a peculiar attitude. He held out his hand and continued, Come, don't let the warmth of old fellowship be all on one side this wintry day. We could see that Mr. Marion took the proffered right hand with his left for an instant, then seemed to shrink away, but exchanged no word of this greeting. I don't understand this, said Agnes, and we both hurried forward. The stranger, seeing Agnes approach, lifted his cap. Ah, your daughter, John, no doubt. I see the likeness to her lamented mother. Pray, introduce me. Mr. Marion's usually pallid features had assumed a still paler hue, and he said in a low voice, Colonel Bludyer, my daughter. Agnes barely bowed. Charmed to renew your acquaintance, Miss Marion. When last I saw you, you were quite a baby. But your father and I are very old friends, are we not, John? Mr. Marion vaguely nodded his head. Well, John, you have often pressed your hospitality upon me, but till now I have never had an opportunity of availing myself of your kind offers. So I have brought my bag, and intend at last to give you the pleasure of my company for a few days. I certainly should have thought that a man of Mr. Marion's disposition would have resented such conduct as this, or at all events have given this self-invited guest a chilling welcome. Mr. Marion, however, in a confused and somewhat stammering tone, said that he was glad Colonel Bludger had come at last, and bade his daughter to go and make the necessary arrangements. Agnes, in silent astonishment, entered the house, and then Mr. Marion turned to me hastily, and bade me good-bye. In a by no means comfortable frame of mind, I returned to the shallows. The sudden advent of this miscellaneous colonel was naturally somewhat irritating to me. Not only did I regard the man as an intolerable bore, but I could not help fancying that he was something more than an old friend of Mr. Marion's. In fact, I was led to judge, by Mr. Marion's strange conduct, that this bludger had some power over him which might be exercised to the detriment of the Marion family, and I was convinced there was some mystery it was my business to penetrate. The following day I went up to the mirror to see if Miss Marion was desirous of renewing her skating lesson. I found the party in the billiard room, Agnes marking for her father and the colonel. Mr. Marion, whom I knew to be an exceptionally good player, seemed incapable of making a decent stroke. The colonel, on the other hand, could evidently give a professional fifteen and beat him easily. We all went down to the lake together. I had no chance of any quiet conversation with Agnes. The colonel was perpetually beside us. I returned home disgusted. For two whole days I did not go near the mirror. On the third day I went up, hoping that the horrid colonel would be gone. It was beginning to snow when I left the shallows at about two o'clock in the afternoon, and Mrs. Balk foretold a heavy storm and bade me not be late returning. The black winter darkness in the sky deepened as I approached the mirror. I was ushered again into the billiard room. 
Agnes was marking as upon the previous occasion, but two days had worked a sad difference in her face. Mr. Marion hardly noticed my entrance. He was flushed and playing eagerly. The colonel was boisterous, declaring that John had never played better twenty years ago. I relieved Agnes of the duty of marking. The snow fell in a thick layer upon the skylight, and the colonel became seriously anxious about my return home. As I did not think he was the proper person to give me hints, I resolutely remained where I was, encouraged in my behavior by the few words I gained from Agnes, and by the looks of entreaty she gave me. I had always considered Mr. Marion to be an abstemious man, but he drank a good deal of brandy and soda during the long game of seven hundred up, and when he succeeded in beating the colonel by forty-three, he was in roaring spirits and insisted upon my staying to dinner. Need I say that I accepted the invitation? I made such toilet as I could in a most unattainable chamber that was allotted to me, and hurried back to the drawing-room in the hope that I might get a few private words with Agnes. I was not disappointed. She, too, had hurried down, and in a few words I learned that this abominable bludger was paying her his coarse attentions, and with, apparently, the full consent of Mr. Marion. My indignation was unbounded. Was it possible that Mr. Marion intended to sacrifice this fair creature to that repulsive man? Mr. Marion had appeared in excellent spirits when dinner began, and the first glass or two of champagne made him merrier than I thought it possible for him to be. But by the time dessert was on the table, he had grown silent and thoughtful, nor did he respond to the warm eulogiums the colonel passed upon the magnum of claret which was set before us. After dinner we sat in the library. The colonel left the room to fetch some cigars he had been loudly extolling. Then Agnes had an opportunity of whispering to me. Look at Papa. See how strangely he sits? His hands clenching the arms of the chair, his eyes fixed upon the blazing coals. How old he seems to be tonight. His terrible fits are coming on. He is always like this toward the end of January. The colonel's return put an end to any further confidential talk. When we separated for the night, I felt that my going to bed would be purposeless. I felt most painfully wide awake. I threw myself down upon my bed and worried myself by trying to imagine what secret there could be between Marion and Bludyer. For that a secret of some kind existed, I felt certain. I tossed about till I heard the stroke of one. A dreadful restlessness had come upon me. It seemed as if the solemn night side of life was busy waking now. But the silence and solitude of my antique chamber became too much for me. I rose from my bed and paced up and down the room. I raked up the dying embers of the fire and drew an armchair to the hearth. I fell into a doze. By and by I woke up suddenly and I was conscious of stealthy footsteps in the passage. My sense of hearing became painfully acute. I heard the footsteps retreating down the corridor until they were lost in the distance. I cautiously opened the door, and shading the candle with my hand, looked out. There was nothing to be seen, but I felt that I could not remain quietly in my room, and closing the door behind me, I went out in search of I knew not what. The sitting rooms and bedrooms in ordinary use at the mirror were in the modern part of the house, but there was an old Elizabethan wing which I had often longed to explore, and in this strange ramble of mine I soon had reason to be satisfied that I was well within it. At the end of an oak-panelled narrow passage a door stood open, and I entered a low, sombre apartment fitted with furniture in the style of two hundred years ago. There was something awfully ghostly about the look of this room. A great four-post bedstead with heavy hangings stood in a deep recess. A round oak table and two high-backed chairs were in the centre of the room. Suddenly, as I gazed on these things, I heard stealthy footsteps in the passage, and saw a dim light advancing. Acting on a sudden impulse, I extinguished my candle and withdrew into the shadow of the recess, watching eagerly. The footsteps came nearer. My heart seemed to stand still with expectation. They paused outside the door, for a moment really, for an age it seemed to me. Then, to my astonishment, I saw Mr. Marion enter. He carried a small night lamp in his hand. Another glance satisfied me that he was walking in his sleep. He came straight to the round table and set down the lamp. He seated himself in one of the high-backed chairs, his vacant eyes staring at the chair opposite. 
Then his lips began to move quickly as if he were addressing someone. Then he rose, went to the bureau, and seemed to take something from it. Then he sat down again. What a strange action of his hands! At first I could not understand it. Then it flashed upon me that in this dream of his he must be shuffling cards. Yes, he began to deal. Then he was playing with his adversary, his lips moving anxiously at times. A look of terrible eagerness came over the sleepwalker's countenance. With nimble fingers he dealt the cards and played. Suddenly, with a sweep of his hand, he seemed to fling the pack into the fireplace, started from his seat, grappled with his unseen adversary, raised his powerful right hand and struck a tremendous blow. Hush! More footsteps along the passage? Am I deceived? From my concealment, I watch for what is to follow. Colonel Bludger comes in, half-dressed but wide awake. You maniac, I hear him mutter. I expected you were given to such tricks as these. Lucky for you, no eyes but mine have seen your abject folly. Come back to your room. Mr. Marion is still gazing, his arms lifted wildly above his head, upon the imagined foe whom he had felled to the ground. The colonel touches him on the shoulder and leads him away, leaving the lamp. My reasoning faculties had fully returned to me. I held a clue to the secret, and for Agnes's sake it must be followed up. I took the lamp away and placed it on a table where the chamber candlestick stood, relit my own candle, and found my way back to my bedroom. The next morning, when I came down to breakfast, I found Colonel Bludger warming himself satisfactorily at the blazing fire. I learned from him that our host was far from well, and that Miss Marion was in attendance upon her father, that the Colonel was charged with all kinds of apologies to me, and good wishes for my safe return home across the snow. I thanked him for the delivery of the message, while I felt perfectly convinced that he had never been charged with it. However that might be, I never saw Mr. Marion that morning, and I started back to the shallows through the snow. For the next two or three days the weather was very wild, but I contrived to get up to the mere and ask after Mr. Marion. Better, I was told, but unable to see anyone. Miss Marion, too, was fatigued with nursing her father, so there was nothing to do but trudge home again. Reginald West Carr, the mere is yours! compel John Marion to pay the debt of honor. Again and again these words forced themselves upon me, as I listlessly gazed out upon the white landscape. The strange scene that I had witnessed on that memorable night I passed beneath Mr. Marion's roof had brought them back to my memory with redoubled force, and I began to think that the apparition I had seen, or dreamed of, on my first night at the shallows had more truth in it than I had been willing to believe. Three more days passed away, and a carter boy from the mere brought me a note. It was Agnes's handwriting. It said, Dear Mr. Westcar, pray come up here if you possibly can. I cannot understand what is the matter with Papa, and he wishes me to do a dreadful thing. Do come. I feel I have no friend but you. I am obliged to send this note privately. I need scarcely say that five minutes afterward I was plunging through the snow toward the mere. It was already late on that dark February evening as I gained the shrubbery, and as I was pondering upon the best method of securing admittance, I became aware that the figure of a man was hurrying on some yards in front of me. At first I thought it must be one of the gardeners, but all of a sudden I stood still and my blood seemed to freeze with horror as I remarked that the figure in front of me left no trace of footmarks on the snow. My brain reeled for a moment, and I thought I should have fallen, but I recovered my nerves, and when I looked before me again, it had disappeared. I pressed on eagerly. I arrived at the front door. It was wide open, and I passed through the hall to the library. I heard Agnes's voice. No, no, Papa, you must not force me to do this. I cannot, will not marry Colonel Bludger. You must, answered Mr. Marion in a hoarse voice. You must marry him and save your father from something worse than disgrace. Not feeling disposed to play the eavesdropper, I entered the room. Mr. Marion was standing at the fireplace. Agnes was crouching on the ground at his feet. I saw at once that it was no use for me to dissemble the reason of my visit, and without a word of greeting I said, Miss Marion, I have come in obedience to your summons. If I can prevent any misfortune from falling upon you, I am ready to help you with my life. 
You have guessed that I love you. If my love is returned, I am prepared to dispute my claim with any man. Agnes, with a cry of joy, rose from her knees and rushed toward me. Ah, how strong I felt as I held her in my arms. I have my answer, I continued. Mr. Marion, I have reason to believe that your daughter is in fear of the future you have forecast for her. I ask you to regard those fears and to give her to me, to love and cherish as my wife. Mr. Marion covered his face with his hands, and I could hear him murmur, Too late, too late. No, not too late, I echoed. What is this bludger to you that you should sacrifice your daughter to a man whose very look proclaims him a villain? Nothing can compel you to such a deed, not even a debt of honor. What it was impelled me to say those last words I knew not, but they had an extraordinary effect upon Mr. Marion. He started toward me, then checked himself. His face was livid, his eyeballs glaring, and he threw up his arms in the strange manner I had already witnessed. "'What is all this?' exclaimed a harsh voice behind me. "'Mr. Westcar insulting Miss Marion and her father? "'It is time for me to interfere.' And Colonel Bludger approached me menacingly. All his jovial manner and fulsome courtesy was gone, and in his flushed face and insolent look the savage rascal was revealed. "'You will interfere at your peril,' I replied. "'I am a younger man than you are, and my strength has not been weakened by drink and dissipation. Take care.' The villain drew himself up to his full height, and though he must have been at least some sixty years of age, I felt assured that I should meet no ordinary adversary if a personal struggle should ensue. Agnes fainted, and I laid her on a sofa. "'Miss Marion wants air,' said the colonel in a calmer voice. "'Excuse me, Mr. Marion, if I open a window.' He tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. "'And now, Mr. Westcar, unless you are prepared to be sensible and make your exit by the door, I shall be under the unpleasant necessity of throwing you out of the window. The ruffian advanced toward me as he spoke. Suddenly he paused. His jaw dropped. His hair seemed literally to stand on end. His white lips quivered. He shook, as with an agui. His whole form appeared to shrink. I stared in amazement at the awful change. A strange thrill shot through me as I heard a quiet voice say, Richard Bludyer, your grave is waiting for you. Go. The figure of a man passed between me and him. The wretched man shrank back and with a wild cry leaped from the window he had opened. All this time Mr. Marion was standing like a lifeless statue. In helpless wonder I gazed at the figure before me. I saw clearly the features in profile, and swift as lightning, my memory was carried back to the unforgotten scene in the churchyard upon the lake of Lucerne, and I recognized the white face of the young man with whom I there had spoken. John Marion, said the voice, this is the night upon which a quarter of a century ago you killed me. It is your last night on earth. You must go through the tragedy again. Mr. Marion, still statue-like, beckoned to the figure and opened a half-concealed door which led into his study. The strange but opportune visitant seemed to motion to me with a gesture of his hand, which I felt I must obey, and I followed in this weird procession. From the study we mounted by a private staircase to a large, well-furnished bedchamber. Here we paused. Mr. Marion looked tremblingly at the stranger, and said in a low, stammering voice, This is my room. In this room, on this night twenty-five years ago, you told me that you were certain Sir Henry Benet's will was in existence, and that you had made up your mind to dispute my possession to this property. You had discovered letters from Sir Henry to your father which gave you a clue to the spot where that will might be found. You, Geoffrey Ringwood, of generous and extravagant nature, offered to find the will in my presence. It was late at night, as now, all the household slept. I accepted your invitation and followed you. Mr. Marion ceased. He seemed physically unable to continue. The terrible stranger in his low, echoing voice replied, Go on, confess all. You and I, Geoffrey, had been what the world calls friends. We had been much in London together. We were both passionately fond of cards. We had a common acquaintance, Richard Bledger. He was present on the 2nd of February, when I lost a large sum of money to you at Écart. 
He hinted to me that you might possibly use these sums in instituting a lawsuit against me for the recovery of this estate. Your intimation that you knew of the existence of the will alarmed me, as it had become necessary for me to remain owner of the mere. As I have said, I accepted your invitation and followed you to Sir Henry Benet's room. And now I follow you again. As he said these words, Geoffrey Ringwood, or his ghost, passed silently by Mr. Marion and led the way into the corridor. At the end of the corridor, all three paused outside an oak door which I remembered well. A gesture from the leader made Mr. Marion continue. On this threshold you told me suddenly that Bludger was a villain and had betrayed your sister Aldina, that she had fled with him that night, that he could never marry her as you had reason to know he had a wife alive. You made me swear to help you in your vengeance against him. We entered the room as we enter it now. Our leader had opened the door of the room, and we were in the same chamber I had wandered to when I had slept at the mirror. The figure of Geoffrey Ringwood paused at the round table and looked at Mr. Marion, who proceeded. You went straight to the fifth panel from the fireplace, and then touched a spring and the panel opened. You said that the will giving this property to your father and his heirs was to be found there. I was convinced that you spoke the truth. But, suddenly remembering your love of gambling, I suggested that we should play for it. You accepted at once. We searched among the papers and found the will. We placed the will upon the table and began to play. We agreed that we would play up to ten thousand pounds. Your luck was marvelous. In two hours the limit was reached. I owed you ten thousand pounds and had lost the mirror. You laughed and said, Well, John, You've had a fair chance. At ten o'clock this morning, I shall expect you to pay me your debt of honor. I rose, the devil of despair strong upon me. With one hand, I swept the cards from the table into the fire, and with the other, seized you by the throat and dealt you a blow upon the temple. You fell dead upon the floor. Need I say that as I heard this fearful narrative, I recognized the actions of the sleepwalker and understood them all? To the end said the hollow voice, confessed to the end. The doctor who examined your body gave his opinion at the inquest that you had died of apoplexy caused by strong cerebral excitement. My evidence was to the effect that I believed you had lost a very large sum of money to Captain Bludger, and that you had told me you were utterly unable to pay it. The jury found their verdict accordingly, and I was left in undisturbed possession of the mirror but the memory of my crime haunted me as only such memories can haunt a criminal, and I became a morose and miserable man. One thing bound me to life, my daughter. When Reginald Westcar appeared upon the scene, I thought that the debt of honor would be satisfied if he married Agnes. Then Bludger reappeared, and he told me that he knew that I had killed you. He threatened to revive the story, to exhume your body, and to say that Aldina Ringwood had told him all about the will. I could purchase his silence only by giving him my daughter, the heiress of the mere. To this I consented. As he said these last words, Mr. Marion sunk heavily into the chair. The figure of Geoffrey Ringwood placed one ghostly hand upon his left temple, then passed silently out of the room. I started up and followed the phantom along the corridor, down the staircase, out at the front door, which still stood open, across the snow-covered lawn, into the plantation and then it disappeared as strangely as I first had seen it, and hardly knowing whether I was mad or dreaming, I found my way back to the shallows. For some weeks I was ill with brain fever. When I recovered, I was told that terrible things had happened at the mirror. Mr. Marion had been found dead in Sir Henry Benet's room, an effusion of blood upon the brain, the doctor said, and the body of Colonel Bludyer had been discovered in the snow in an old disused gravel pit not far from the house. A year afterward, I married Agnes Marion, and, if all that I had seen and heard upon that 3rd of February was not merely the invention of a fevered brain, the debt of honor was at last discharged, for I, the nephew of the murdered Geoffrey Ringwood, had become the owner of the mirror. End of A Debt of Honor, A Ghost Story Recording by Colleen McMahon